Good morning. It's good to be here. Good to be with you again. Up here, at least. I'm always with you, but hey. It's been a while since I've been up here, so I'm looking forward to this morning. I hope you are. Are you? <laughs> well, it's, uh, I, I, this morning I was... I went out and was watering our plants and flowers and things, and I was, we had these little daisy things around a little bird bath, and I was watering them, and and the Lord just, I believe, spoke to my heart as I was <clears throat> watering them. A prayer that God would water us today, and as I was. Thinking about that, so I was watering and realized when you water your plants, it washes off the dirt and stuff from the week or however long it's been since the last time you watered them. <laughs> and it nourishes them, keeps them alive, especially when it gets dry like it is now. And so I want us to pray together this morning that uh, God will take his word and water us. The Bible says that uh, he washes us with the water of his word. Isn't that right? So would you, would you mind to stand with me? And I want you to pray with me. And don't just listen to me pray, but I want you to, to reach out to the Lord. And let's, let's really ask the Lord to, to touch us this morning and, and do that very thing. Lord, we, we come to you as this congregation, Lord. And we're amazed that you, you call us your children, you call us your people, your church. And today, Lord, we need to be watered. Lord, we need your washing. Wash off the stuff that got on us this week that didn't need to be on us. Cleanse us, sanctify us. And Lord, Give life to us, just like water gives life to the plants. Come and, and do a great work in our hearts, I pray. And I ask you for an anointing on this message today. And an anointing to rest on all of us as we hear it. That you will come and do a great work in our hearts. And change us, strengthen us. And equip us as we walk this journey with you, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, you can be seated. Well, we have been walking through a series that we've titled The Unlikely Heroes of the Bible. And today, we're going to be looking at a really fairly famous, well-known, what we might call a hero of the Bible, and he wasn't because he was so perfect by any means, but we're going to be looking at the man Samson. And when you think of Samson, you kind of think of Superman, if you know the story of Samson, which probably most of you do. Most of us have heard the story of Samson many times. If you're raised in the church, you heard a lot of stories in kids' church. You know, Samson, you know, the champion, you know, tears down the pillars and kills all the Philistines and does great works for God. So big question for me when was, okay, well, why, why Samson as an unlikely hero? It looks to me like he was a pretty likely hero. I mean, uh, an angel came and foretold his birth. I mean, an angel appeared to his mama. You're going to have a son. He, she was barren. Isn't it interesting how many times God uses barren women to bring forth a deliverer? He was called to be a lifelong Nazarite. And if you're not familiar with that phraseology in the Bible, there was a, an oath people could take in the Scriptures to be a Nazarite, which is basically a, a person set apart for God. They weren't supposed to cut their hair during the time of their 
of their oath, their vow they would take, and they weren't to drink any wine or eat any grapes or anything that came from the, uh, the vine. They weren't supposed to touch any dead thing. Uh, they were set themselves apart and not be in any way unclean before the Lord for a period of time. Well, Samson was called to be a Nazarite from his birth for his whole life. And he was an anointed superman. If there was ever a superman on this planet, it was Samson. I mean, you read the exploits that Samson did and you go, oh, oh, oh that I had those kind of muscles, that kind of power. I mean, the guy was... Amazing. And so, why an unlikely hero? Well, to those of us who know the story, and I'll be telling some of the story today, he has some very deep character flaws. But God still used him. So in that sense, an unlikely hero. And so today we're going to attempt to, to learn something about Samson for us. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, and it says, Now these things happened to them, speaking of the Old Testament people, as an example, and they are written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The things that are written in the Old Testament were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. Now the end of the ages started with Jesus. <laughs> And so all of the New Testament saints, these things were written for our instruction. So in other words, we can learn something from the life of Samson. So I want to start out by just giving us a bit of a historical account of Israel uh, in their first 350 to 400 years in the land uh, uh, of Israel, in the land that God had promised to Abraham. You know the story of Moses. He brought the children of Israel out of Egypt had been in bondage for 400 years, and uh, they stay in the wilderness for 40 years. They receive the law of God. They become God's people. He establishes uh, a lot of things with them, and then he, Joshua takes over after Moses, leads them into the promised land. They have great victories. They drive out a majority of the major uh, powers in, in the Canaan land, and, uh, and then Joshua passes on, and a new generation comes, and so that the historical account in the book of Judges starts there with Joshua when he dies and carries all the way through to the prophet Samuel. Samson is the last of the judges of Israel before Samuel. And so he comes toward the end of that 350 years. Now just to give us a bit of a comparison, and so maybe we can relate a little bit, 350 to 400 years, well, 400 years ago, this year, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. 1620. This is 2020. This is the 400th anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims. And we know from history, and you're learning, and I'm learning a lot about our Christian heritage, that the beginnings of America are pretty rich with a Christian heritage. Very, very rich with uh, great moves of God, great revivals, uh, great people, uh, a lot of, not perfect by any means, but a lot of great things that God did in establishing the United States of America. And the parallels are really pretty amazing. And so we come to, to, to back to Israel here, and they come into the land, and they basically are set up to be a self-governing people, under what we might call a theocratic republic. They were, they were a republic. They weren't under a king. They were 12 tribes. They chose their leaders. Sometimes God chose their leaders. And those leaders were called judges. And their constitution, if you will, was the law of Moses. The law of Moses was to be their governing document for their nation, both religiously and civilly. All the civil laws of Israel were in the law of Moses. Laws concerning property, laws concerning life, laws, everything. You've, if you've read through the first five books of the Bible, you've read the law, and it's pretty detailed. 
And they were not ruled by the priest, although the priest had power. The priest did have power. They had authority. They were not ruled by a king or, or governors or those, those kinds of things, although they had those, much like we have here in the United States. They chose their leaders. They were ruled by the rule of law. They were guided by the rule of law, the law of Moses. And in Judges 21, the very last verse of the book, and we won't have this up because I just put this one in here. Judges 21 and verse 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that's okay if what's right in your own eyes is what's right in God's eyes. You, hear, you, you, get, you catch where I'm going here. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, which can be a good thing if you're self-governed under the laws of God. But we're going to find that that wasn't always the case in the book of Judges. Because the book of Judges records the waxing and the waning of God's people in their devotion to him. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 11, if you have your Bibles, you can go there. I think it will be up here. Judges chapter 2 and verse 11 says, Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So they forsook the Lord and they served Baal and the Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he gave them into the hands of plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies around them so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had spoken and as the Lord had sworn to them so that they were severely distressed. Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. And yet they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot after other gods and bowed themselves down to them. They turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflict them. But it came about when the judge died that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not listened to my voice, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will keep the way of the Lord, to walk in it as their fathers did or not. So the Lord allowed those nations to remain, not driving them out quickly as he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. That's, a, that's kind of a sad picture. I used to read the book of Judges, and I would think, what is wrong with you people? You know, they would, they would turn to the Lord, they'd have a revival, and then they, the next generation come and they would do evil on the side of the Lord. Do you ever get it? And, it, and they don't. It, it's just like it just keeps happening back and forth, back and forth. And you see, God's anger would burn against them. And then God would pity them. <laughs> God's anger would burn against them. And then God would hear their groanings and he would pity them and he would raise up a deliverer. What it must be like for God to have to deal with human beings. Because we are a mess. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a mess. <laughs> and so am I. 
<laughs> because we are. And it, it kind of, then it kind of dawned on me as I, the more I read, the more I read history, and the more I looked at America, and the more I looked at my own life, and I went, oh, okay, we're not far removed from them at all. Judges is a book about sin. And it's a book about the devastating consequences and the sad cycle of how, now listen, how freedom and prosperity can lead to complacency, indifference, and compromise. I just finished a book by a man by the name of Os Guinness. It's titled, A Free People's Suicide. I highly recommend this book. And he made a statement in the book, and he said, the greatest enemy of freedom is freedom. The greatest enemy of freedom is freedom. What do you do with your freedom? Paul told us, don't let your freedom become an opportunity for your flesh. Vigilance and keeping yourself self-governed under the laws of God is what keeps us free, saints. If we lose that, we lose our liberties because we come under a bondage, and that bondage is a bondage to sin, which produces external bondage. So you see how this book is highly relevant to us as a people. We'll get into some of that a little later. <clears throat> like I said, Samson is the last judge before Samuel and the end of their republic. When Samuel comes, the people, after 400 years, say, we're, we, we're done with this. Give us a king. Give us somebody who will take care of us from cradle to grave. Does that sound familiar? We want a king. We want somebody who will who'll take care of us and will fight our wars and who'll 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 do this. And Samuel warns them, and that's another story, another sermon for another day of what would happen. And they said, That's okay. It wasn't okay. And they lost their republic and became a kingdom. The book of Judges reveals mankind's deep need of a savior, doesn't it? It really does. Who can deliver us from our true enemy, ourselves, our fallen nature, our fallen human nature? Well, we'll talk about that champion toward the end, too, because God did send us a champion. Hallelujah. Turn to Judges chapter 13. Samson. It says, now the sons of Israel, verse 1 through 5, the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had borne no children. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have, no, have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now therefore be careful not to drink wine or strong drink nor eat anything unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So here we have Samson called from conception, set apart as a Nazarite unto God to be a deliverer for Israel. God was hearing the groanings of the people. Again, he was having pity on them, and he was going to raise up Samson to deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. Now, just, just imagine, if you will, and let's think, because we read these things many times, and we don't think, oh, they were in the hands of the Philistines. The Philistines were very cruel. Matter of fact, just about every nation was cruel in that day. And to be under the bondage of, of a conquering nation was a sad thing. They would kill you. They take your children and put them in slavery. They rape the women. They did all kinds of and they, It was not a pretty scene. And you were under heavy bondage, fear they would disarm you, take away your weapons so you couldn't rise up against them. And they held you in great bondage. And it was not a pretty picture. But people were groaning under this. And God calls Samson, and he's going to be a deliverer. 
He was called to be a Nazarite for life. And, and when we say a Nazarite for life, basically he was called to be separated unto God for life. Now I want to call your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 through verse 7. There's chapter 7, verse 1. And I want you to listen to what God says to his people. This is Paul preaching to the church in Corinth about being set apart for God. He said, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Now look at your neighbor and say, you're the temple of God. That's a little better than the last time, right? You're the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I'll be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, Paul says, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I'm going to read that one again. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You see, each one of us are called to be Nazarites to God. Set apart. Don't touch what's unclean. And perfect the holiness In the fear of the Lord. And what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is the respect for God, that what he says he means. See, God told the children of Israel, if you'll keep my law, if you'll keep my commandments, I'll bless you in ways you can't even imagine. But if you break my commandments, if you step away from my covenant, if you deny my covenant, then I'm I'm going to bring some tough stuff on you. And you're going to become like your neighbors. The children of Israel had become like their neighbors. But God calls us out to be a separated people unto him. And so we have to be vigilant with that in our own lives as we raise our children. How do we keep the world out of us? It's not easy, is it? Because it's always trying to creep in. But it's no different than it was then. Judges 13, verse 24 <clears throat> Thirteen, verse twenty-four. Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. The child grew up, and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanim, Mahadan, between Zorah and Eshtal. Then Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. And his father and his mother said to him, what the heck? (laughs) Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? What's wrong with you? Did your children ever do anything? And you go, what's wrong with you? Well, Samson did. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she looks good to me. He's a young man. She must have been highly attractive. However, his father and mother didn't know, now listen to this, that it was of the Lord. For he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now at that time, the Philistines were ruling over Israel. So Samson grows up blessed of God. The Spirit of God comes upon him, begins to stir him. 
And then Samson goes and falls for a Philistine girl. And he wants to marry her. His parents are not happy. They are upset. What are you doing? <laughs> upset. But they didn't know, it says, that it was God's plan to deliver Israel. Now, as a parent, as a Christian parent, or them as a Jewish parents, probably fairly devout Jews, they knew they weren't, God had commanded them not to intermarry with the people in the land. And so in their mind, he's off his rocker. In their mind, Samson is, is violating the covenant with, with God. And it certainly looks like he is. But this time, God had another plan. And it says it right here, but they didn't have any way of knowing that. I mean, they didn't, they weren't able to read the book of Judges. They were the book of Judges. <laughs> they didn't have that to, to draw from. All they had was the law of God to draw from. And it said, don't marry people from other countries. But it says it was God's plan. You see, sometimes God gets out of our box. And God will not be kept in a box. Don't put God in a box. That doesn't mean you don't pay attention to the Word of God. You don't try to live your life by the Word of God. Sometimes you just won't understand. Because, frankly, it's none of your business. It's God's business. And I'm sure God understood the parents. He probably had compassion for the parents. He's going, I know this is hard for you and you don't understand, but I can't tell you right now what I'm doing. You'll, you'll read about it you know, a few centuries from now. <laughs> and uh, you'll, you'll understand what I'm doing here. I got a plan in this. But he had a plan against the Philistines. And so Samson gets married. His dad says, all right. He goes and gets her for him. Now, there's no evidence here yet that Samson is immoral because he marries the girl. He goes down, he's sorry, he came back and said, Dad, I want to marry this woman. He, they figure out, they get married. And so they get married, and they're having the wedding feast, and it lasts for days back in those days. And, and you know the story. He, he has a riddle, and he, he kills a lion with his bare hands. That's manly. Killed a lion with his bare hands, ripped him like he would a kid, it says. And he has a riddle, and these guys figure it out because they plow with his heifer. As the Bible says, they, they get the riddle out of his wife, and she tells him, and he gets mad, and he leaves, and he goes back to his mom and dad, and he, he won't have anything to do with her for a while, and he stays away for a long time because he's upset. And then one day he's like, you know what? I'm going to go back to my wife. He goes back to his wife. Well, he goes to his father-in-law, and his father says, oh, I thought you hated her. I gave her to your friend. She got married to somebody else. That did not make him happy. Samson got really mad, upset. And so he goes out and he just kills a bunch of people. And then he goes out and sets the grain fields on fire. And he's upset. He is mad. He's ticked off. And then they come down and they, they, the Philistines kill his wife and his uh, father-in-law. And so Samson goes to war against the Philistines. And the Philistines, they got, we got to stop this guy. And they go to the people of Israel. And they, go to, and Israel, they say, hey, listen, you give us Samson or we're coming after you. So 3,000 Israelite men go down and they say, Samson, I mean, you didn't go to get Samson with two guys. They're going to find out you don't go get him with 3,000 guys. Who? They come down with 3,000 men and, and they say, listen, we got to give you up to the Philistines because they're going to they're make life hell for us. He says, well, promise me you won't kill me. Just tie me up. He's probably thinking, yeah, that's not going to do you any good. <laughs> So they tie him up with ropes. They take him down. Here the Philistines come up with an army. And he sees, the, sees them, and he's looking around. He sees the jawbone of a, of a donkey laying there. He's like, oh, that'll do. He breaks the ropes like they're thread, picks up the jawbone, and goes to swinging, kills a thousand Philistine soldiers armed for war. And uh, great victory. And it says, then he ruled Israel for 20 years. The Philistines quit messing with Israel at that point. Not because they were afraid of Israel. They were afraid of Samson. One man. That's deliverance. Anointed by God. And then Samson, the story goes on. 
And Samson's morality begins to wane. And somewhere toward the end of that 20 years, he goes down to some city and sees a harlot and goes into her and spends the night with her. And, and then he gets tied up with a girl named Delilah. And you know the story. And Delilah is very conniving over time. She finally gets him to reveal the source of his strength, which was his separation to God, manifested in his <clears throat> never having shaved his head, his Nazarite vow. And she gets him to go to sleep. And I've often wondered, how, how deep a sleep would you have to be in for somebody to shave your head and not wake up? And then it hit me that he was probably drunk. What was part of his vow as a Nazarite? He's supposed to never drink wine. But most likely he was slobbering drunk. Shaved his head and she'd wake up Sam- Samson. And then, of course, you know the story. He lost his strength. The Bible says he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. They came in. They gouged his eyes out. Ah. Oh. You ever poked your eye? Gouged his eyes out. There was no pity. Put him in prison for a long time. His hair begins to grow. And in that time in prison, Samson cries out to the Lord. It took quite a punishment for him to get it, come back to his senses, but he did. And he cried out to God. And God redeemed Samson in that prison. And, of course, you know the story. He has one last chance. They bring him out, put him between two pillars at this Massive party, and they were jeering at him. Bring him out that we can have sport with Samson. They didn't know that his hair had grown back, and they didn't remember. And, of course, you know, they put his, he put his hands on two pillars, and in this house, there was this building. There were thousands of people, and he knocked the building down. And 3,000, I think it was, Israelites died that day. I mean, Uh, Philistines died that day, and his victory in his death was greater than all that he had done while he lived. So Samson was an unlikely hero because of his deep character flaws. But God worked with him, and God restored him, and God used him as a deliverer. Now, what can we take away from this story for us individually, corporately as a church? There's a few things that I want to touch on that I think maybe God would speak to us. One is that God doesn't only work with those who are perfect. If you got that video, you can prepare that, John. John, or whoever. Yeah. God God doesn't only work with those who are perfect. Can somebody say hallelujah? We all know that we are failures in ways with the Lord. and Hopefully we turn and repent before we get our eyes gouged out. (laughs) But God doesn't work with only those who are perfect. And so we must... Never put God in a box. He can only work with certain types of people. He doesn't just work with the Billy Grahams of the world. He works with you. And he'll work with me as we follow him. I got a video clip that I'd like to to play that I think will minister to you. And I'll come back here and uh, share some thoughts about this. It's really a cry of what God can do with people that are surrendered to him. Go ahead. Revival in the Hebrides. We need sound. In the early 1900s. Began to move. Moved up to the pleading for it into the 40s. Maybe we could say it topped out in the early 50s. Two old women, one was 84 years old and one was 82 years old. One was blind and one was humped over so badly with 
The spine still notice it's just, just arched over. But they had passion for revival. They wanted God to work. This, this is what happened. They couldn't even get out to the church to pray. They couldn't even get out to the church to worship. Their house became a place to meet. People came in. They got so passionate about revival coming to the, their isle, the Isle of Lewis. They got so passionate about it. They confronted the preacher and wanted to know if he was thoroughly right with God. <laughs> and they prayed and prayed and prayed. And they'd seen the Lord, they said, with the church filled up and God blessing a great overflow. And the fire of God struck that tiny little obscure place off the coast of Scotland. And when it happened, there was a young teenage boy that got saved in it. His name was Donald. And the preacher became so dependent upon Donald and so close to Donald, he would ask him to lead in public prayers and help him with the meetings, and he did. Oh, how God worked. People began to hear about it, and the revival fire spread. It spread. And God blessed in a, in a great way. Those two old women, the people, kind of people, people don't want in their church anymore. And from that same island, there was a, a young girl who was a cousin to Donald Smith, who immigrated to America. Her name was Marianne Smith McLeod. She came to America and in 1936. She met a man named Fred. And they were married. They fell in love. They were married. God blessed in a great way. And those old women were her aunts. And they came out of that fiery revival, that fiery revival. They really experienced revival. And they sent a Bible copy of the Word of God that had been used in a special way in that revival to Mary Ann. She started having children. I think it was 1937, she had her first child. They named him after his father, Fred. Then she had her second child named after herself, Mary Ann. Then she had her third child, Elizabeth. Then she had her fourth child, she was so impacted by this teenage boy God had used in that revival of the Hebrides. She named him Donald. And she gave him that Bible, that Hebrides revival Bible. He was born in 1946. He's now the 45th president of the United States. And that revival Bible is in the Oval Office. I'm saying to you, I don't know how, why, I don't know how it all comes together, but I, but I believe God is putting some things together to give us just a window, just a window, if he, if he could find some open people who know what the wind is for. Can this be... The time, the wind is open. Providentially, God has prepared the moment. And we will become the people of prayer, pleading with God. This is a plea. Will thou not revive us again? Will you, will you, will you be a part of that? Will you? Now that, uh, that is not an endorsement of Donald Trump. That's about those two ladies. Two old ladies, weak, physically, powerful with God. God does not only work with the perfect or the great. He will work with anyone 
who will yield to him. And they saw, I read about this revival. It was an amazing revival. You can read about it, the Hebrides revival. And there's conflicting stories about whether the Bible's in the Oval Office or now it's in the, in the, uh, uh, the Bible Museum there in, in uh, Washington, D.C. But they're his great aunts. And he swore in on that Bible. There's no power in a Bible. There's no power in the pulpit. There's no power in a piece of paper. But there's power in the prayers of two great aunts. How far reaching are the prayers of God's people? You can lose hope when you see what's going on in our world and forget who we are. We are God's people, we have a voice with Almighty God. And if God's people will turn and, and humble themselves before Him and turn from their own wicked ways and, and cleanse ourselves and get the Philistines off of us and, and their ways off of us and turn to God in prayer, what could God do? Is this a moment? I believe it is. And so what do we learn from Samson's life? That God doesn't just work with, per with perfect people, but He will work with people when they humble themselves and they cry out to Him. And even if they have to be redeemed from something they've done terrible, God will hear their cry, He'll forgive their sins, and He'll heal their land. Saints, you are powerful with God. And we must never forget that. We have to remind ourselves of that. When you hear the news all the time, we see what's going on. Yes, we're in trouble. Yes, we have turned from God as a nation. It is time for God's people to call unto the Lord and do exactly what He told us in the Bible, and He'll respond exactly like He said He would. He will hear from heaven, and He'll heal our land. And so don't think you're insignificant. Don't think your prayers are not heard. They are heard, both individually and corporately. They will be heard. This is not a time for us to sit back in fear. It's a time for us to rise up in faith in our God. What do we learn from the Samson? Well, one other thing we learn is that ignorance of God's Word among God's people and compromise with sin both nationally and individually, lead to serious consequences. We learn that from the Scriptures. But God works within the framework of fallen human beings. He's always had to work within the framework of a fallen world. There's always sin and there's always uh, an attack against the church, an attack against God's ways. There's always going to be that. But God works within the framework of the fallen world until He will bring it into redemption. And He looks for His people to be the people He can work through. Samson is a type of Christ in the Bible. You see, we have a champion redeemer whose name is Jesus Christ. We have a champion redeemer. Samson was born from a barren womb. Jesus was born from a virgin. You don't get any more barren than a virgin. Samson was set apart from his Conception, Jesus Christ was set apart from his conception to the redemptive purposes of God. Samson was anointed by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God began to stir him in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, verse 43. Speaking of Jesus, says, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. I said, and with power. And how he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. We are the receptors of our champion redeemer. He, unlike Samson, is the sinless son of God who conquered not Philistines. He conquered sin and its power. He conquered death and its power. He conquered the grave and its power. He is the conqueror. And all those who believe in him and receive him will receive him to a glorious end. Can somebody say amen? Samson was a type of Christ. They brought him out and said, let us mock him. They brought him out. He was blinded. And they stood him up and they mocked him, threw things at him, spit on him. Then he leaned against two pillars. And he put his hands on those two pillars. And he brought deliverance to God's people, a temporal deliverance. Jesus Christ was let out, and they mocked him, and they spit on him, and they had sport with him, and then they nailed him to two pillars. And he didn't just win a battle, he won the war. He destroyed sin. He destroyed the devil. He defeated the enemy. He defeated the enemy of our soul. And now, because God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. See, sin no longer has its power over you or over me. And we don't have to yield to its temptations. We can rise above that because of Him. Because of the Spirit of God. And that's what God needs in this hour. He needs us. He calls us to remember our champion Redeemer and let Him fill us with His Spirit and go forth in our hour to be deliverers to our generation. And let it not be said of our generation that we did evil in the sight of the Lord. May it be said in our generation that a great revival came. May it be said in this generation that the people of God humbled themselves and prayed and sought God's face and cried out unto Him until revival came. And a great awakening swept our land and turned away the wickedness and destroyed the wickedness and, and raised us up and God delivered us through the champion Redeemer. Could it happen, saints? Can it happen? It can happen. It must happen. It must happen. We need to cry out for revival. We need to see that God has given us a moment. I believe God can redeem this land. And we won't have to go the way that Israel went. But we can have a great move of God in this nation. I want my grandchildren to grow up in a nation that has been impacted by revival, not by sin. And God has turned us around. And we can come back to the faith of our founding fathers and be a people that call upon the name of the Lord. Can you believe that with me? If God will work through a man like Samson, he can certainly work through a person like you and me if we will just come. Every Thursday... At noon here, John Long is leading us in prayer, revival prayer. If you can come, please do. I haven't been able to make it yet because of work. If you can come, even for a little while, come. It's at noon, right, John? For an hour or however long. And pray and cry out. 
Let us join together as a congregation. If you can't come, mark it on your calendars. Try to get it in your mind that at noon on Thursday, fast and pray. Give up lunch on Thursday and pray. And let's pray together for revival. That God will pour out His Spirit. If He can do it in the Hebrides Islands, why not here? Why not now? Why not in Columbia? Why not at, at, at Center Point Church? Why not throughout Boone County? Why not Missouri on fire for Jesus? Why not an awakening that sweeps the land? People are praying all over the country. God will hear those prayers. So get that on your calendar Thursday. Pray all the time, but let's pray corporately. Let's trust God. Come if you can. Set apart that time if you can. And let's pray together. Can we do that? Matt, would you come up? So, I hope you're inspired. I hope you're ministered to enough to make a difference that we're just not coming to another Sunday message and go away and forget what I said oh that we would respond oh that we would respond and see that we have a champion redeemer who's calling us and he wants to pour his spirit out upon us that you could be a champion for your day. And this generation can be a generation that brings revival to this land. Would you stand with me? We're going to close in prayer. And as we stand here, you just close your eyes and, and if, if even if you maybe have, you see areas, maybe God's touched in your life, you, you've strayed away from God or whatever, then just, just remember that Stampson turned to the Lord and, and God restored him. He'll do it for you if you'll come. And then let's pray together. Lord, come and heal our land. Lord, Pour out your spirit upon us. Pour out your spirit upon us. These pe people right here in this room today, Lord, pour out your spirit in this place. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord, a spirit of prayer. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to call upon you, Lord. Help us to cleanse ourselves from that which is unclean and come before you and Perfect holiness in the fear of God and cry out to you, Lord, and heal our land. We need you, Father, to come and heal our land. We cry out to you, O champion redeemer. Lord Jesus, come and do it, we pray. We are your people, Lord. Teach us to pray in this hour. And I pray this over you as you go. This benediction prayer, the Lord bless you. And the Lord keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.